Hello, everyone. For Telesur, I'm Cody Weddle in Caracas, Venezuela. Happy Monday. Thanks for joining us. To begin, Argentinian President Mauricio Macri, he has taken a decisive step in his plans to roll back the policies of former President Cristina Fernandez. During an activity on the outskirts, in the outskirts of Buenos Aires, Macri announced that in the coming hours, he would sign a decree to eliminate direct taxes on the exports of soy and other grains. Now, uh, President Fernandez's government used these funds for social welfare projects and infrastructure. The issue caused a major conflict with landowners in 2008. Macri promised that the country will duplicate its food production, but he didn't exactly explain how. I am here because I trust in you. I know that it is true what the papers say, what the strategic planning reports say. We can double food production in Argentina. We have to stop thinking of whether we develop industry or the rural areas. It's the rural farmland and the industry. It's the farmland and the country. Also, the president's telecommunications minister has already uh, sparked some anger. Macri will, ha will have to face large protests set for this Monday. Now, the minister, Oscar Aguad, said during uh, the, over the weekend that the current media law that seeks to democratize mass media will not, will not stay in place. Aguad's declarations come as the new government is reviewing the law. The media law promoted and passed during Fernandez's administration was drafted mainly by social movements fighting for a less concentrated media landscape and wider views in their coverage. Also in Argentina, a developing story today and a sad story. At least 41 police officers have died and several more have been injured after their bus drove off a bridge in the Salta province in the north of Argentina. It plunged there into a riverbed, a dry riverbed. Now authorities believe that the accident was caused by mechanical failure given that the road was not a dangerous one. We move on to Colombia now where the Attorney General has received the testimony of several journalists that would be victims of an illegal spying program presumably carried out by the National Police. Now the investigation follows a scandal which began after journalist Vicky Davila accused police of spying on her. The Colombian police chief is currently is under a wide scrutiny and has been called by the Attorney General to testify as well. A group of Colombia's leading journalists unveiled a network of illegal businesses being ran by the police, which would allegedly trace back to the chief of police, General Rodolfo Palomino. In a major breakthrough also there in Colombia, the FARC guerrillas have announced they are willing to negotiate their disarmament. Now the announcement comes ahead of a new round of peace talks in Havana, Cuba. The rebel group said that the victim's reparation point on the agenda will soon be resolved. Now that's why they have established a platform to analyze a potential disarmament process. While we are closing the point of the agreement on the victims, we have built the platforms to analyze the topic and of the conflict, and we have made progress on some initiatives regarding the sixth and final point of the aforementioned agenda. And a delegation of victims' representatives is heading to Havana now to uh, join the peace talks as some minutes ago a final agreement on that point was confirmed. Now to understand more about uh, this development uh, of peace talks, uh, we turn to our correspondent there in uh, Colombia, in Bogota, Natalia Margarita. Hello there, Natalia. Uh, we are closing into the end of, the, of this victims' reparation point here on the agenda what will be the role of the delegation of victims that we were just talking about, uh, that delegation that's heading to Havana? Well, in fact, a spokespersons uh, from both peace delegations in Havana have confirmed today morning that the discussion on this issue of victims reparation and justice have finally concluded there. Uh, and that they have, both parties involved, have successfully uh, reached an agreement on that point of the agenda. It is important also to remember, Cody, that this point of victims and justice includes 75 uh, sub-points. 
So what they have just announced is that, in fact, uh, both parties involved have reached an agreement on each and every 75 sub points of this uh, major point in the agenda as his victims and justice. Now, the details and the full text of the agreement, it's going to be released tomorrow during a ceremony that it's going to be held there in Havana around 10 a.m. in the morning local uh, time in Cuba. And that's the reason why 10 uh, members of the victims' delegations uh, travel today to Havana to take part tomorrow in this, uh, con uh, in this ceremony where the details and the content of this agreement is going to be released to the public, Cody. And we heard, Natalia, that the FARC has said it's ready to disarm. That seems like a, a significant development. How significant is it? And uh, what are the chances that we could have a final agreement, a, or a truce rather, before Christmas? Well, on the one side is the issue of disarmament. So basically what the FARC have said is that now that an agreement on the issue of victims and justice has, uh, has been reached, so they are ready to start discussing the very last point of the negotiation agenda, which in fact includes the issue of disarmament. So that is basically what it is about. Now having disagreement in the issue of justice and victims, basically uh, the path is already paved to discuss the very last details uh, of the peace process, which I insist include this issue of disarmament. disarmament. On the other hand is the issue of a truce, no? Uh, but a bilateral uh, truce we're talking about here, because we need to remember that the FARC has been successfully implementing a unilateral ceasefire since the 20th of July this year. So what it's basically at the stake here is to see if the government is going to finally agree to reciprocate this unilateral ceasefire so that for this Christmas we can finally have a bilateral ceasefire here in Colombia. We still need to see if this is going to happen. That would be a good uh, Christmas present for many Colombians there, a bilateral ceasefire. We certainly hope they can arrive to that agreement. All right, Natalia, thanks so much. Back to you, Cody. Moving on, Costa Rican President Luis Guillermo Solis arrived in Havana on Sunday for a visit that will focus on the Cuban migrant crisis there in Central America. Now, this meeting comes after weeks of Costa Rican-led diplomatic talks to find a way to send the migrants to the United States. The original plan was to send some 4,000 Cuban migrants stranded in Costa Rica to Belize through an airliner so that they could continue their trip to the U.S. However, the governments of Guatemala and Belize said last week that they would close the entry to the migrants. Thousands took to the streets of Sao Paulo to call, Paulo to call for the ousting of President Dilma Rousseff. Right-wing and op opposition activists gathered to renew calls against the government and the ruling Workers' Party. The move comes a day before the Congressional Ethics Committee will decide if it will investigate the lower House Speaker Eduardo Cunha over corruption. Now, Cunha has led calls for Ruf Rousseff's impeachment. President Dilma Rousseff accused the opposition Social Democratic Party, headed by her former rival, Aicio Neves, of being behind the calls for her ousting. It is no news, Tanya. It's impossible that journalists here could be surprised by the impeachment process and the proposals being made by the lower house speaker, Eduardo Cunha. It's all PSDB. It was always them, or someone here did not know that. Because if not, it would be something very hypocritical, pretending that we never knew that. And confronted by rumors of Rousseff's involvement in trying to steer different parties towards backing her, President Rousseff vowed to continue fighting impeachment attempts against her. Now, the rumors come after tensions between her and Vice President Michelle Temer, who is also the head of the Democratic Movement Party, PMDB. I understand I understand that Temer has his considerations in relation to the PMDB. He's the party's president. But the government has no intention of intervening in the internal affairs of the PMDB or the Workers' Party or the PR. But the government will fight an impeachment. They are completely different things. Teachers in Mexico are organizing new actions against a government-endorsed education reform. Now, the reform has uh, sparked weeks of clashes and strikes 
by Mexico's largest teachers union. Now the teachers are planning more demonstrations to liberate 52 students and teachers jailed in the state of Michoacan. The education reform has been criticized by higher education authorities as well. Analysts and critics agree that the reform gives more control to the federal government and undermines academic autonomy. And with more on that story reporting uh, from Mexico, we turn to our correspondent there, Clayton Kahn. Coordinator of Education Workers, or CNTE, the Independent and Dissident Public Teachers Union uh, that has been protesting in recent uh, weeks uh, the implementation of teacher evaluations and the overall education reform, lament the lack of transparent and public dialogue with the Education Secretary. It was late November when the CNTE publicly made the call to openly dialogue with the Secretary's Chief, Aurelio Nuno, after the authorities implemented very strict security measures around public teacher evaluation sites in recent weeks and months. Now, the dissident uh, teachers argue that Nuno has implemented a militarization strategy around the polemic evaluations, which the opposition believes is a means to filter out dissident teachers uh, and reduce hard-fought labor rights for public educators. Now, yesterday in a public protest, the CNTE called for Nuno's resignation, calling him more apt to be an official of public security rather than public education. Now, in related events, members of Mexico's National Institute uh, for the Evaluation of Education, or INE, uh, have also denounced the Education Secretary's implementation of the teacher evaluation, claiming that a process of prior consultation with Mexico's public educators before the implementation of the evaluation was essentially denied by the Secretary. As we have been reporting, the dissident teachers um, and many sectors of Mexican society have rejected the evaluations and the education reform as a whole due to its lack of allowing participation from the teachers themselves uh, as well as a lack of dialogue with the dissident teachers. Ms. Clayton Khan reporting for Telesur here in Mexico City. FIFA official and former president of Honduras, Rafael Cajejas, decided to turn himself into the United States government as part of the ongoing U.S. investigation on corruption in FIFA. Now, Callejas is a prominent member of the ruling National Party there. The Honduran government did not respond to extradition requests made by the U.S. government. Bolivian President uh, Evo Morales joined a rally at Sucre organized by his ruling MAS party to begin its referendum campaign. Now, the president warned that mainstream media outlets there and opposition parties are trying to confuse people with dirty tricks. The president is currently campaigning for the yes vote to amend the Constitution, which would allow Morales to run for re-election. And with more now, we turn to our correspondent there in Bolivia, Dimitri uh, O'Donnell. He is in La Paz. Dimitri, uh, we have seen polls in favor and against. It's unclear uh, whether Bolivia, the Bolivians there, will support the, this referendum. So tell us, if you can, what's the atmosphere, atmosphere there in the streets in Bolivia and what are we seeing in the polls? Yes, Cody, there's been a sort of air of indifference here in certainly in La Paz and around the country because campaigning really hasn't begun until today. A couple of weeks ago, we saw in Congress that very divisive debate which allowed the referendum to go ahead when senators debated for a marathon 18 hours on the decision to whether to proceed with that referendum, which will be held next year on February 21st, 2016. Since then, there's been not a lot of campaigning on the streets, certainly a little bit at weekends. And the polls, some are in favour and some are against. It just seems at this moment that people haven't made up their minds. They haven't got the information. There's not been a lot of information distributed on both sides. The odd campaign poster here and there. But certainly for now, Bolivians it's all to play for, certainly for Evo Morales, going forward on, on February 21st, 2016. Next issue, we heard uh, President Morales there harshly criticizing the press. So what is he criticizing? How has the press there been covering this issue? Well, it's really all kicked off today, Cody, because the opposition yesterday 
claimed that the Morales government, and certainly Evo Morales himself, was guilty of nepotism. They accused Morales of planting members of his family on the state oil company, something which he has claimed vigorously denied, said is not true and is part of a dirty tricks campaign. He says that in the past, yes, the right-wing governments that were in office in Bolivia for many years, they were guilty of such practices. But he said this is not the case with his government and that nobody in his family, his brother or his sister, play any active part in politics. So this is really the first sign that we've seen of the opposition coming out and trying to hammer Morales with any claims that they can. And Morales has kicked back today and said that this is not the truth and if this is the way that the campaign is going to go forward and the, the tone of the campaign he had to speak out simply because he didn't want to be part of this smear campaign is which which is what he has labeled it he said he's been called many things in the past he's been called the andean bin laden he's been called a drug trafficker but he's definitely not going to take this line down he's not going to take these claims that nepotism is a part of the bolivian government Demetri O'Donnell there reporting from La Paz. We will count on you to continue keep us updated as this campaign there kicks off. Dimitri, thank you. On Sunday, dozens of civilians were killed in attacks by Syrian government and Russian forces on the ground in Syria's Damascus suburbs. Now the United Nations is speaking out. I am deeply saddened by the aerial attacks that reportedly hit a school in Douma, eastern Ghouta yesterday. A child was also killed and others injured in a mortar attack in the Ain Kash area of Damascus city. This is a tragic reminder of the urgency of finding a political solution and securing a nationwide ceasefire. A teacher has been attacked in a Paris suburb by a man wielding a box cutter and scissors who cited the so-called Islamic State group. Now, according to police, the teacher alleged he was stabbed in the side and throat while he was preparing for his class earlier this Monday. But his life is not in danger. He did survive. The teacher said the attacker then fled. The probe has been taken over by anti-terrorist investigators, as they're called, but eventually the man confessed that he made that story all up, so it remains unclear. The investigations there continue. On Sunday, Marine Le Pen's far-right National Front lost the French regional elections, which has set her back in her hopes of being a serious presidential contender in 2017. Now, even though the party lost, it had won more votes than any other party nationally in last week's first round. Despite the loss, many see the increase in National Front votes as a warning and uh, that many voters are ready for a change there. EU foreign ministers have met in Brussels earlier this Monday to discuss developments in Iraq and Libya as well as commitments on counterterrorism. Now, out of those uh, talks, some controversial plans for an EU border and coast guard force, which will be formed as part of an EU drive to curb the record influx of migrants. However, some national governments are weary of granting the EU new powers in such a sensitive area of sovereignty. With the downing of a Russian plane by a bomb on October 31st uh, killed all 224 people on board, the need for some way of mitigating an explosive device on an aircraft has been heightened. Now, it seems an international team of scientists, they have developed a technology that may, may be able to contain the force of an explosion if a device hidden in an item of luggage detonates. Now, it's called the fly bag, and it is made from multiple layers of fabrics and uh, composites that have high strength and impact and heat resistance. In Saudi Arabia's municipal polls, at least 17 women have won seats in the country's first ever elections open to female voters and candidates. The elected women come from vastly different parts of the country, ranging from Saudi Arabia's largest city to a small village near Islam's holiest site in Mecca. One such woman is Rashfa Hefzi, who won a seat in Jeddah. The 38-year-old said the presence of women on the local council would help other women. 
On December 11th, Burundi erupted in violence where nearly 90 people were left dead. Now, it was the worst outbreak of violence there since a failed coup that took place in May. Belgium was a former colonial power, and its uh, for, uh, foreign minister said that he would take the matter up with his counterparts before the EU meeting held earlier this Monday. And Western nations are suddenly concerned for Libya, the country which has been in an internal war since Muammar Gaddafi's ousting in 2011. It has become a priority for Western leaders after new reports claim the Islamic State group is planning to establish its headquarters in the city of Sirte. Negotiators in Rome said they were expecting a deal to be signed on Wednesday this week to address the matter. Others, such as the German foreign minister, promised a deal before Christmas. As Tokyo struggles to get its 2020 Olympic Games plans on track, Japan's sports authorities have released two proposals for the new national stadium to be public before it enters its final review. The, the Japan Sports Council said that both of the proposed stadiums are eco-friendly and within the $1.2 billion budget cap. They also meet uh, the completion deadline set by the International Olympic Committee of January of 2020. In Germany, an annual event takes place called the Krampus Run, and it's an annual event that traditionally takes place in Munich. Now, while uh, what's it all about here? Well, attendees wear, check it out here, they wear masks of the Krampus Beast, and they make their way through observing crowds out of which occasionally individuals are picked and mock beaten, okay? The Krampus is a folklore beast that is portrayed as one who punishes misbehaving children as a contrast to St. Nicholas, the old Santa Claus. Now, the beast eventually became known as Santa's evil, Santa's, Santa's evil sidekick. Okay, the French, the freak rather, is a Charlie Chaplin masterpiece that uh, never was. A book published earlier in December in Switzerland has, for the first time, given a full account of the unfulfilled project which Chaplin meant to be intended to be his last picture. Now, the famous filmmaker wrote the synopsis for the story in 1969 at the age of 80 and worked on the project for another two years. The family kept it a secret until now as they wanted to protect their father's story. That's what we're covering this Monday morning here from Caracas. We have plenty more on all of those stories and plenty others at our website, telesurtv.net slash English. Join us on uh, social media, our website as well, uh, telesurtv.net slash English, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. For Telesur English, I'm Cody Waddle. Have a great Monday. Have a great week.